Some of you have heard of that name, Abram Joshua Heschel, because he marched with Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma, and he described it that he was praying with his feet as he was walking there. Here was a man who had a sense during the Vietnam War to say, I am a Vietnamese, you know? Like saying, if you're shooting, look at me, you know? If you're shooting, that's whom you're shooting there, you know? I'm Vietnamese. He was a good friend to the students at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Those of you who have been reading spiritual things, or very often Matthew Fox or others, they will have a quote of Buber and then of Heschel. And Heschel had such a remarkable way in which he was talking. He would say, God in search of man, for instance. And most of the time we always begin with a God idea and we say, huh? We made it all up anyway, you know? <laughs> so it is man making himself a god, or man in search of God, what have you. But he was turning it around. And when he turned it around, God in search of man. So you make a mind move, you make a flip inside your mind at that point. And no longer do you see yourself as the center of the universe. You know, something is happening, you start to say, ah. Uh -huh. There is this power that has made and shaped me, that is looking to find me. Where am I? No, you know, how will I face this power that searches to find me? And that's a wonderful turnaround because it meant that one is giving greater reality to God. He grew up with Polish, Yiddish, German, uh, some French, all kinds of languages. And he's good in all of them. But when it came to English, that's where his poetry showed itself more than in any of the, the other writings, except the Yiddish ones, which I translated. And that's what I want to bring to you. I met him first at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And I had felt that he was writing a great deal more about sort of debunking something about God at that time, rather than pointing to the living God. But so I, I and I was still a card-carrying Lubavitcher, you know. So I came and I sort of challenged him. And he said, keep on reading. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, he still has some, some other things to say. He took a sabbatical and was in Minneapolis, and I lived at that time in Winnipeg. So I wanted to, I knew that I would get more time with him in Minneapolis than in New York when he's in his office. And I, we made a date, and we had a remarkable date together, in which I saw uh, a person who really knew how to let people who live with the myths of America appreciate what's going on in the myth of Judaism. I visited him once, and I still thought there was only one way of Hasidism, which was Lubavitch. And he gently and kindly took a book off his shelves that he knew would turn me on. It was the writings of Rebarn of, of Karlin, and he gave that to me. And that was such a wonderful door for me to go and explore other things. Um, 
in many ways. He, he was a mensch, you know? Uh, he didn't take things casually. So one day he's walking down Broadway and there is this street corner preacher saying, Sir, are you saved? <laughs> No, sir. he says, thank you. You see, that's not my question. My question is, what's the next mitzvah I have to do? Isn't that amazing, you know? Again, flipping. I'm not here because I'm trying to achieve a great whatever, something, salvation, you know? I'm here because I'm deployed to do God's work. And so, he later on took sick. He traveled all over America. I remember once he came to Winnipeg and how he, after three hours, this was supposed to be like a sermon for 20 minutes, yes? Uh, but, uh, the people, he, and he was talking about the Sabbath, and he said, about the Sabbath, he can wake me up in the middle of the night and I'll go anywhere to speak about the Sabbath. The sense he had was, that this was our sanctuary in time, and that we have to think of time in a much more sacred way. And that was his book, The Sabbath. Beautiful, beautiful book. The last sentence of the book is, eternity uttered a day. You know, think of that, that once a week there is a day which is not in rush time, but it is a day that eternity had uttered, and it's, it's here for us goes to such a wonderful high place. So, I was interested in this person who had opened this way of thinking to me, of flipping yourself around. He came to Winnipeg and talked for two and a half, three hours. Then the people were saying they wanted to hear more because as he was getting into the Sabbath, you had a sense how much we have to wash out of our head notions like the Puritan Sabbath. So today you can't go fishing, you know, you aren't supposed to make love to your wife. You, you get the idea? You have to be holy as the Lord's day, as if the Lord doesn't dig stuff like that. <laughs> you know? And then to get to the place where you would say, call the Sabbath a delight, dedicated to honor God's name, you do that, I'll make you sit on top of the world. I'll feed you the endless treasures of your ancestors. You hear stuff that's being offered for that day. So, and this was the hardest thing for many Jews in America, to close the store on the Sabbath, to not make appointments with a dentist for Saturday and stuff like that. And so he, he was so moved to try and tell people, about the Sabbath. In this book, The Earth is the Lord's, he goes like this. There they would tell you a mice. What's a mice? A mice is a story in which the soul surprises the mind. A mice is a story in which the soul surprises the mind. Now, do you get that? You get that, you, 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 you're getting sort of eagerly like a kid. I want to get surprised, soul surprised by my, go ahead. <laughs> it's like the readiness for insight that, that we have. Another one, he was saying, the Hasidim were singing a nigun. What is a nigun? A nigun is a tune flowing towards his own unattainable end. A tune flowing in search of his own unattainable end. Yeah, da, 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 da. And you come back and you start singing all over again. And there isn't a good way to say, da, 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 it's finished. You know? <laughs> because it always keeps on going. A fervent gesture, you know, when Jews talk with their hands. He described that a fervent gesture is as if you were to put something in divine quotation marks. <laughs> a knech, a knech, 
uh, it means a little twist, but he translates it so that you can get it. A knage is the subtle shading of a thought. <laughs> if you want to say a very subtle thing, it's not quite this, it's a little more like that, you know? And you give it a knage, you know? Uh, Heschel was traveling all over the United States and Canada and other places, and wherever he came, I remember we were in Brazil, and people still remembered with joy what his uh, presence was like there. So, and all this took a toll on him, and he was writing the last bit of a book on the Rebbe of Kotsk, <laughs> And it was on the last uh, section of Genesis, which speaks about the death of Jacob, that Saturday morning he passed on. He had a uh, heart attack about a year and a half before that time. And when he was in the hospital, one of his friends snuck to me a Xerox copy of the Yiddish poems that he had written when he was young in Warsaw, in Berlin. And <coughs> so I translated them from the Yiddish and sent them every day, another one, to the hospital and to his home and he recovered. Some of them he wasn't so happy about my translation. <laughs> and I don't care, you know, because I was doing this because I was in love with those words that he spoke when he was young, you know, and I had my sense of what that was like. You got to remember here is someone who, as far as secular studies is concerned, had to do, in his youth, he had to do it all by himself. He was being filled a lot with Talmud and with codes and with Torah stuff, and they had expected him to be the next in the line of Hasidic masters. But there was ferment in Warsaw at that time. People like Peretz and Bialik, great writers, and there was a sense, you know, if you can imagine, between the uh, two world wars, toward the end of that time, close to the Second World War, before the Nazis took over in so many places. If you wanted to get a place where you would have your mind lifted a little bit, you wouldn't go to the synagogue. You wouldn't go to the church. In Vienna, you would go to a cafe, okay? And there you would sit with other people who sit in the cafe. And this one would say, last night I wrote the following poem. And the people would say, ah, please read, you know? Or when Bialik needed to have uh, a group of people who would dig his attempt in verse to describe what Vivaldi tried to describe in the Four Seasons. And it's a wonderful poem called Habrecha. So for whom would he read this if not for those people who would dig the way in which he turned a Hebrew phrase to express something with, with a surprise in it, you know? So that's where people met. And he hung out there too. And he was filled with ideas that came to him from his training and from his soul and from his ancestry, which had something to do with the greater universe. Had something to do with being face-to-face uh, -face with a living God and interacting with that God. So here is a poem that he wrote when he was young. He calls it I and You. Messages proceed from your heart to mine, exchanging and blending my pains with yours. Messages proceed from your heart to mine exchanging and blending my pains with yours. Am I not you? Are you not I? My nerves' tendrils are intertwined with yours. Your dreams meet in mine. Are we not one? 
embraced in multitudes, in all others form I see my own self perceiving in the laments of humanity distantly voiced I discern my own whimpering self as if my own face was behind a million masks of suffering beings. I live in me and in you. Through your lips a word proceeds from me to myself. Can you imagine this process on the inside of yourself in a moment of contemplation? Through your lips, O oh God, a word proceeds from me to myself. Your own eyes, teardrops, dwell up in me. In needs distress, do call me. If you need a friend, if you need a friend, you must open the door between us. You live in me as well as in you. You know, it's good when you hear uh, stuff like that, that there is a line that you would then say, that's a good mantra for me to have, you know? I live in you, you live in me. <coughs> you know, it's a good mantra to have. Here he writes another poem. He is talking about that sense that you have that so much compassion is needed in the world and how inadequate we all are to deal with the needs, the hurts, the pains that people have. So from time to time a soul hears a calling from God that says, whom shall I send and who will go for me? And just like prophet Isaiah answered, okay, I heard the call, I'm going, you know. So, here is how he describes his response to the call. Send me to death's bedside with a good word, some news from you. Send me to someone who is dying so I can give him a living word regards from you that you are. If you cannot respond to that lonely call that I'm sending out. Send me to help or someone else. No righteous Jeremiah curse is my reply to men so poor, so weak. I think that yours their guilt is, yours their fault. Their sin is your own crime, not theirs. It is instead of asking question if there is God, how could he be good? If, if there is good, how could there be God? He says, uh, I will tell you what I feel about your not responding. It is your task to help, O oh God. But you keep still to human cries. So help me to help. I will fulfill your duty, God. Your debts I will pay. Let me always feel and suffer along when human hands in danger stretch to reach the brakes, to stop your world, a brake you never did install. Send me to answer calls like an eager aid, to extinguish pain with gentle help. Send me. Send me to pebble, to rock or bloom, to worm in agony or to a human. Help me to help. You have a sense of the cafes that I mentioned to you before, but 
there was something else happening at the time. Socialism was very real for people at the time. There was a sense that we can do it right, the workers will unite, they will own the, the means of production, it will be a good world, everything will be in cooperation with each other, and so on and so forth. And at that time, somehow people would say that they became communists, figuring the Mashiach isn't going to come, that was promised, we need the Red Messiah. And they would be singing in, Yid in Yiddish, Das wird sein schon in der letzten unentschiedene Kampf for the Internationale, okay? It was a, there was a sense that, yes, there is a real hope there. We will get out from under the domination of people. There were people who would uh, get rich from selling arms to both sides of the war. And into this kind of thing, these things are talked about all the time in those cafes from that point of view. But he isn't happy with the political discussion. He asks, where is it really going on? What's really happening? So here is sort of the blues, if you will, and night lament when he talks about what is lonely stuff in the city like at night. Drowsy, tired houses, squat and torpor, silent sufferers stir in them. A shard of life on a threadbare quilt winks to a trick, promising lust's joy for a buck or two. And people loiter, laugh, and say, all right. Cars bark, bark, hark, rolling trolleys, rolling, lolling, bed lambs issue piteous pleadings. Will our hopes pregnant seedlings ever grow to fruit? or rot. Sidewalk corpses lie embalmed in snow. Like a poor whore, the river shivers. Heavens weep into my bosom, a sinister sinking woe. Winds wail, weeping help, as if in me God were at hand. Why do you not help? You, you. I hear my body tick, like some insomniac's clock. Through dinky dying streets, furtive footfalls make their way. Street lights thread rays of yearning through tired, sleepy needle's eyes. My booze stone brother rocks like a soft candle held in a sweaty palm and taps a feverish tattoo on the cobbled walk, as if he guided a gaggle of geese to the slaughter. Or does he yearn for me, for home, or human love? He would, these failing him, light his butt by the street lamp and rasp a tune. Lady night wretched me up to rebuke, puke me, puke by puke. Like flies a buzz fly the lying lies. Like a comatose sufferer the world is sung in muted sleep. Somewhere in the dark, Someone's pain leaps up in an agonized scream. <sighs> a mystic poet in wailing prayer hears a weeping, luminous of God. We're going to move a little bit to some happier places. And, but he still is very much the fervent devotee here. <coughs> there are some uh, situations where you have, like you're walking down the street and you don't know it and you don't want to even turn around but you know you're being followed. Okay. There are some of us who, at times when things are quiet inside, feel that God is following us, you know, and say, um, sometimes, watch where you go, you know. So he, 
he describes this. God pursues me everywhere. God enmeshes me in glances and blinds my sightless back like a flaming sun. God pursues me like a forest, a dense. My lips are ever tender, mute, so amazed, so like a child lost in an ancient sacred grove. God pursues me like a silent shudder. I wish for tranquility and rest, and he urges, come and see how visions walked like the homeless on the streets. My thoughts walk about like a vagrant mystery, walks through the world's long corridor. Like a vagrant mystery walking through the world's long corridor, my thoughts walk about. At times, I see God's featureless face hovering over me. God pursues me in the streetcars and cafes. Every shining apple is my crystal sphere to see. To see what? How mysteries are born and how visions come to be. You know, as, as I read it, I sort of feel also how I feel it, because most of the time I, I don't often read these out loud, you know? And it sounds a lot different when I do, even to me. And then I get the sense that they're so rich, so dense, you know? Uh, I don't know what to do to go on to the next, or sit a little quiet in between, because they say so much and they stir so much in us. So I'm going to read you another one called The Word Most Precious. Each single moment greets my life, a message clear from timelessness. All names, all words recall to me the word most precious, God. Pebbles twinkle up like stars, silent raindrops echo true, what all creation echoes to my father, teacher, word from you. My all, your name is my safe refuge. Without your nearness, I am not. So lonely, so saddening is that thought. Without your nearness, I am not. All I possess is just this word. If forgetfulness will snatch a name from me, let it be mine, not thine. So screams and dread that heart of mine. With every word I nickname you, I call you woods and night and ah and yes. With all my instants weaving sacred time, a bit of ever always is my gift to you. Would that for eternity I could celebrate a holiday for you, not just a day, a lifetime, please. How insignificant is my thrift and gift. Of offerings and adoration, what can my efforts do for you but this? To wander everywhere and bear a living witness that shows I care. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to ever read Rhino Maria Rilke's poems. If you have, there is a booklet that he calls Das Stundenbuch, the Book of Hours. And there he has something that was also happening to Heschel at that time. And it goes to the thing of 
who is God for you when you no longer want him to be Papa, Mama, or King? <laughs> so there is a point where Rainer Maria Rilke writes a poem, you're my neighbor, du Nachbar Gott, you know, you neighbor God, when it's dark at night and you have no one around to hand you a glass of water, call me, I'll bring you tea, you know. So he, he does that, the root metaphor has shifted because he needs to have access to God, but in a way that will be heartful and not demand the sense of power over me and me having to be <laughs> submissive shmati, you know, but rather, uh, rather in that sense in which God wants to have company, there is a moment of I downness which creates an equal moment, okay, where I'm not just a nothing. Okay. So he calls this poem Brother God, Brother God, God, Confined one, straight jacketed in labyrinths of the infinite. God confined one, a foot on sidewalks fleeting. Oh, how divinity masks you, God. <laughs> Almighty isn't your only attribute, you're sad and bitter too. At times you treat me like a child treats some of those his seniors with some awe. Our brother, our brother, which art in heaven, at endless final light, tender down to us and gently kiss each creature in soft embrace. sense in which sometimes when you go up so very high, you know, in the sense of the flight of the one to the one, when your soul and God is all that there is and there is nothing else, you know, sometimes you can get so, um, what's the word, blown up from that and it's easy to forget who is around and who is having trouble and so on. So here is another one of those <clears throat> in which he protests and yet at the same time knows that it has to be as it is. This one is called Intimate Hymn. From word to word I roam, from dawn to dusk, dream in, dream out. I pass myself in towns, a human satellite. I wait, I'm hopeful, as one who waits at the rock for the spring to dwell forth and ever well on. I feel as bright as if I tented somewhere in the Milky Way to urge the world to feel I walk through lonesome solitudes. All around me, lightning explodes from my glance to reveal all light to unveil faces everywhere, Godward, onward, to the final weighing, overcoming heavy weight with thirst, constantly the longing of all born call out, is anyone around? Mm -hmm. I know each one is he, but in my heart there rides a tear, when of men and rocks and trees I hear, all plead, feel us, all beg, see us. God, lend me your eyes. I came to be to sow the seed of sight in the world, to unmask the God who disguised himself as world, and yes, I wait to be the first to announce the dawn.
In his youth, uh, he had the occasion to use one of the modes in which we do meditations, which is the one that we keep in mind sometimes for the good night prayer. Into thy hand do I commend my soul, a sense of grateful, relinquishing life back to God. So he writes, him to the Lord of time at the very last hour. Each hour's fascinations beckons to my desire like some curious, eager, adolescent timepiece thirsting for more time. And every evening passes heavy like a train departing with my beloved on, exacting years of dream from me. The narrow ridge of life's last night when, Lord of time, I'll give to you the sweet remainder of my life. How fully then my heart will offer to you your treasure and bid you a good eternity forevermore. <laughs> oh, this is such a wonderful uh, book. By the way, we have some for sale in the back <laughs> if you want them. I figured some of you may want to take it home so you can spend time with them a little bit more than as you can hear it so quick. Here I'm going to go to um, where he is talking about falling in love. Here is this wonderful young Hasidic person walking in the streets of Warsaw and seeing all kinds of beautiful people at the time when his heart and groin is waking up, you know. And here goes this wonderful, uh, very sweet and innocent uh, poem, The Longing of My Early Youth. How much I wish to be in love, to be close to someone, and to wander pleasantly in dreams, to serenade someone with stormy, raging songs. How much I wish to be in love, to believe in you exclusively, that you really are my tender, dear one, to give you all my wondrous joys, to give you worlds set to prose. How much I wish to be in love, to go about drawing magic room, you, you, my smoldering fantasy filled with your face, your whims to be my holy creed, your musing smile, my consolation from despair. How much I wish to be in love. For each moment I have prepared a birthday gift, I do not know, I swear, what purchase is my longing made in dream. Come and take my heart's dearest treasure, my love. <coughs> Can you remember that time when you were hoping that it would happen, you know? It's that place where deep inside we are all waiting, uh, like Cinderella, for the prince to come with that shoe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here is a poem in which is almost as if that uh, ideal inside of him has become more uh, concrete for him, you know. Uh, it's on page 39. <laughs> so, this one is called Dedication. Oh, pledged mine. Heal my sadness and wrap me with a word, and wrap me with a word of yours. Be a barrier against my unrest. Be a launching place for my ecstasy. My youth and home I pawn, my dreams are yet unrealized. They rise up incessantly in tides that flow out 
in the ebbs of eternity. I roam, goaded, guided, uncannily propelled by nets of rains. My tired limbs renew their strength on the most narrow pallet on which they rest. Permit my strivings both to nest upon your swelling waves. May my visions away on distant journeys find a haven in your sweet face. O oh, pledge it mine, heal my sadness, and wrap me in a word of yours. Be a barrier against my unrest, for my ecstasy a launching place. You here have him talking about um, how before he didn't give himself the opportunity to so strongly look at who might be my ideal and what might she be like. And more and more, he, as he writes these poems, it gets closer. I have so much more stuff, but I'm looking at the clock. So I'm going to some heavy ones, and then I think we're going to have some nice ones. <laughs> I didn't want to leave you with a bad taste, but this one is really, really strong. I have a feeling that it expresses that, um, how would I say, the holy frustration that many of us have in which we feel that the energy we put into our spiritual stuff should be better rewarded than it is. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, answer, O oh Lord, answer ever and uh, sorry, answer, O oh Lord, our never-ending yearning. Break your vaunted silence, cosmic king. Release at last those prisoners who from ages past begged you to reveal yourself. Leave us not imprisoned in the maze. Reveal to us your goodness, not your cleverness. Enthrall us not, but teach us joy. Why do you abuse our trust and mock us in our pride for you? Is our cry too great for you to hear? See how we cloak our longing in human passion, our thirst for you, our thirst for you in lustful act, while your enduring silence is our hell on earth. Yet, I feel your ear close to my lips and know that even your caprice is gentler than my greatest pity, but at times, my gall burst, brutalized, and with a thousand other screams that God and God alone our adversary is. Then to you, my voiceless word, I cannot speak, and stronger than my faith, stronger than my faith in my despair. O Lord, I gladly will exchange all holy graces, all spirit rungs you grant for just one light-filled word from you. I wish that I could make this prayer part of what they would say every day in Congress, in the Senate. Prayer for all rulers. O Lord of hosts, do not bestow on me the shame of victory and might. If my debasement will console my victims, then me do the fame. My soul sees in stubborn refusal anything from me but combat, no. If I ever take up arms to wage a battle, I beg you then, me, to defeat. My heart will bear with greater ease the pain of losing and defeat than victory's intoxication. I'll do that again. My heart will bear with greater ease the pain of losing, the pain of defeat, than the intoxication of victory. 
those whom justice has betrayed, do help them, do protect. And I would rather be the wronged one than puffed up with triumph's pompous field. Trophies proud, they do remind me in my joy of shameful deeds, hearts betrayed and unmet needs. O oh Lord, do not bestow on me the shame of victory and might. If my debasement will console my victims, then me do the fame. Um, you get to hear the great soul and that great heart that he had and the way he did, he did it. Uh, the greatest fun I had was when I came to his nature poems. And this wasn't so easy, <laughs> because in Yiddish, he said, Heint hat geregnet mit Bromfen, which would be, uh, uh, the rain came with, with um, vodka. <laughs> it rained vodka. Uh, that, that's that wonderful sense of how earth smells at times after the rain, you know, that, 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 delightful at-homeness on this planet. So, today, rain bandied brandy on the fields. <laughs> Amid the woods, a drunken tree to dancing yields. Juice, sweet berries turned the young blood heads, and blades of grass revel, romp in their beds. Clouds join hands in an enchanted dance like elves. Rocky road reveals roadness, and reeling midst of them my many heady selves. A soundless song in harmony, with tears of joy unspent, as tender yearning with grateful bliss did blend. Embracing branches strain toward me and dip their outstretched tips, Feel them brook come bearing kisses on their lips. My breast breath leaves leaves all moist with dew. Yet all I am a silent sunbeam in ether is blue. Bereft of words, bereft of breath, consumed and thrall. I'm nothing, nothing. Yet I am the all. <laughs> Sam Keen did his uh, book, the first one that I got to a dancing god. In there, he had um, a wonderful chapter on how to, to how to learn how to love. And he says people usually begin with the hardest object to love, another person. <laughs> uh, uh, he said begin begin with a stone. You know, learn to love a stone. <laughs> it's so wonderful, right? Now. There is a place when you love a tree, you know, you love, you, you, you love that which is out there. <coughs> My lover, you, O tree, I like streets and fields, but you I love. You I love even more. You are a soul unrecognized. My darling, dear, O tree, you answer quietly and rarely. Barely in some dream, you dear trees in the woods, you know me well from the solitudes in which I share with you a love and secret. And the pulse of some branch I hear and understand most clearly the gesturing devout of your mournful mind. As soon as I enter the woods on tiptoe, I'm transformed to treeness. I call you sire, parent, spruce, your child has come to you. And I begin to mumble in the tongues of mutes and tell the tree folks how I feel, how well I am or sad, and how I yearn and long and seek. And when some gust abducts a leaf in some strange thicket, I gently reach and place it right like a mother's hand, a child's 
hair that strayed. Somewhere between wind and vault, some treelet young and thin broke suddenly an arm. I tore off my cloak and dressed it with my sleeve as a bandage. Tammuz in the field. Okay, I think we're gonna do this one, and I don't know, would you do me a favor? I want, I'd like to say a memorial prayer for him when I'm finished with the next poem. Um, yeah. Poplars will crown green flamingos Hiding bill under feathered wing, stand on the long, lissom legs and proudly preen their feathered plumes. Poplars. Yeah. Warm earth, opiate for one's feet, feel sun baked, warm and sweet, all fresh and fragrant, just as if they and the world were just now created. All lies in heat in the bosom of the sun and sips the wind the luscious juice of space. How good, how pleasant thus to drink the secret and nibble gladly on the blade of grass. Then subtly sparse at first some drizzled drops, asperging earth from dust dry curse. Then thunders, chauffeur blast, purging showers, exercising drowsy demons from the land. Then soul fans quiet joy so lightly, grateful fields kiss air streets poisoned toes, gently sobered fields now nerves renewed with ten with purest tenderness the universe, gently sobered fields now nerves renewed with purest tenderness the universe. Gadal wie it kadashen i rabba, the oma di vacher u te, we am echal u te, we chayechon, u fjonechon, u chayedechol beit Yisrael. Bar galar di zman karifi, bram men yehei shemei rabba nebarach, lorlam, olom me omaya, it barach, vish dabach, vi baar, vi tromam, vi nase, vi tadar, vi tale, vi talal shemei de kutshe veriwe. Leila mi kol birchata vishirata, Ta-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-